I uh, understand that you're talking about uh, prayer here uh, in the last week or two, and, and uh, I think you'd entitled it Dangerous Prayer. I thought that was kind of a unique title. <laughs> so, you know, I gave that some thought, and of course, uh, the thought this morning is going to be, use me, God, use me. And I gave that some thought, and you know, I didn't know anything, really, when I entered the ministry in 75, because I had uh, ended up uh, getting, we were born again, my wife and I, when we were 70, uh, in 1972, and uh, I had never read the Bible, never. I didn't know anything about the Bible. We never read the Bible at home or prayed or, and things like that. We just belonged to a, some big denomination. We went there unless there was something else to do. And uh, it was just a religion. And uh, so, you know, a couple of years later, we ended up in Ramah and uh, came out of there in 75. And I'm still scrambling, you know. Uh, I'm pastoring now, and I figured at least I should memorize the books of the Bible. <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't have a clue what I was teaching. I just, you know, it, it just did not become a revelation yet. And so God has a special plan for that first church. Special gifts, I believe, in heaven <laughs> for putting up with me. And But Brother Hagin said, you know, if you don't know what to preach, you know, take my books. And he didn't have very many of them at that time. Put them up on the, at that morning before graduation and said, uh, you know, take the revelation that God's given me and you should have that... Uh, Shouldn't take more than two years to get the revelation. And you should pass me up, you know. Well, so I did, you know. I, I, I had that old big old royal typewriter, you know, and try to get, you know, <laughs> something done uh, by Sunday, uh, you know, just uh, listening to his messages. And then finally I took his books and, you know, put them in a notebook with holes punched in. Didn't want people to think I was reading out of a book. <laughs> <laughs> what a way to start. <laughs> but I'll tell you, when I... Uh, when I accepted the call that God had in my life in, uh, uh, while I was in Rhema in October of 1974 is when it happened. I was home from class, and in that afternoon, uh, I was just worshiping the Lord in the living room. My wife had gone out to get something and uh, just having a really, really good time with the Lord. And then finally, I felt just to get quiet, and of course, that's when he said he had called me to ministry. Well, I didn't understand the five-fold ministry gifts. I understand, well, I knew there was some... Uh, classmates of mine that had come down to Ramah and because Brother Hagin stood in the office of prophet they came down to become a prophet well I didn't uh, denomination I was in pastor that was it you know there was nothing ever nobody talked about prophets or apostles they didn't even talk about Jesus as far as that goes but uh, so I, I didn't have any clue about the fivefold I felt comfortable teaching and, and you know getting comfortable pastoring but uh, it was really a stretch. And uh, so, but I had a desire in me because the word had set me free in Rhema. If I hadn't gone there in 74, I, wouldn't, I, I never would have lived much longer past that. It literally saved my life, the word and the spirit. And so I came out of there and with the little bit I did know, I just had a fire inside of me. I just needed to share it with everybody, you know. Well, so that first year we pastored, and was at, I, I was believing to take over an existing church, a small one where I could practice. <laughs> and so I did. I got one with 12 people. And uh, I did not. And uh, so that was in September of 75. And then in the, just less than a year later, the following spring, I'm in prayer. And I, I felt the Lord wanted me to resign. And I thought he had another church to me. It just didn't make any sense. Shared with my wife, and thank God she didn't agree. And uh, I says, well, we're not going. But you know, it wasn't shortly after that, my wife starts talking about us moving. I says, what in the world happened to you? You know, and we had no reason, you know, the church went from 12 to, uh, I was 82 or 84 people. So it was really growing. And so finally we announced it to the congregation, and uh, we had no reason other than we were doing our best. We were taught to be led by the Spirit, you know. At Raymond, that was another life changer. So I didn't understand exactly. So we traveled over 10,000 miles that summer looking for that little church, or another church rather. And uh, finally, we ended up back in the same town we just left. And as I hit the city limits, I just knew that I was to travel 
And that blew me away because I thought you had to pastor about 20 years before you started traveling, you know, all my head in the way. Finally, I, I knew it was him, and I said, well, look, if this is you, then you, know, you open the doors. That's just where I was at. If, 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 other than that, I'll just pump gas. <laughs> you know, I'll get a job. <laughs> and you know, I was invited to speak at Full Gospel Businessmen because their speaker had not showed up or canceled or something. And of course, they knew about my testimony. And so I went and spoke at Full Gospel Businessmen, and that opened the door to everything. And God, at that time, used Full Gospel Businessmen to launch our ministry because I was speaking all over the country because there happened to be people at the meeting from different states and what have you. And then people wanted Bible studies. A person came up to me right after the first meeting with the Full Gospel, and they knew about me because they're from the same town. They wanted to know if I'd come to their home and do a Bible study. Well, of course, I'd go anywhere to do, you know, to teach the word, <laughs> you know, practice, 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 <laughs> whether it's, a, you know, the city jail or whether it's a retirement home. There were two little grand, uh, two little, uh, well, three little grand ladies, older ladies, much older than me, and I'd go to their home, teach on Tuesday afternoon, and they'd give me a glass of milk and a cookie. <laughs> 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 it was, and all of a sudden, I mean, I was literally, from 1970, when that started in 1976, I was literally preaching every day. I took every opportunity there was. And so I didn't really know, realize really what was happening. But now, talk about a dangerous prayer. When I accepted the call that he had, me, had uh, for me in Ramah uh, in October of 74, I... Uh, with, I just uh, said, okay, but I'm going to, there was one thing I made clear with the Lord, that when it comes to meeting our personal needs, that he would have to be my source. And so I read, you know, just in case he didn't remember. <laughs> I, I opened the Bible and says, see this here, John 16, 23? And in that day, you he said to them, you will ask me nothing. Most assuredly, I say to you, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. Until now you've asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. And I said, now look, if this doesn't work, I have nothing to preach. And because of my background, and most of you, well, maybe I don't know. Some of you know my background. But anyways, alcoholism, drugs, and the whole mess, you know. And that whole business of alcoholism, drugs, and all this stuff in this, as a sinner, you know, it's nothing more than a con game. Mm. Trying to talk people out of their money, you know, using, you know, manipulating them and all of that. And I couldn't afford to have any of that. I didn't want any of that. And for the simple reason that it, because of my background, I, it's going to have to be God and not Jim Caseman manipulating people. Mm. And so now I'm not saying that, I mean, that's what he had to do with me because of my background. I'm not saying that's for everybody. But little did I realize, <laughs> there was going to be a lot of stretching moments. You know, believing, just believing. And uh, then I know about two or three times in this last 45, 40 some years, you know, my staff would come to me because now the ministry's grown, there's churches and, you know, and they got a staff and regional directors and whatever, and things were tight. And I remember two or maybe three times they says, no, look, you just got to let people know. This isn't just you. You got to let people know about your needs, blah, blah, blah. And so I yielded, and of course, it was flat. Nothing happened. I knew I missed God. And so I had to repent. And I said, you're my source, not people, and not meetings. And I uh, had a situation of a year, a little over a year ago, where I, had a, where I cut back on meetings because, uh, I, well, I became a caregiver for my wife. And she doesn't like any other nurse. I'm her nurse. <laughs> She's very personal. <laughs> and, uh, so I cut back. So the agreement was I would go out once a month. Now that's different than, you know, first 23 years I was, uh, I was, I was, I was gone, uh, you know, a month at a time, four times a year overseas, four months of the year, a month at a time. I'd come home and I'm traveling across Canada and the United States, coast to coast, and I'm home on the average one week a month. And we don't like to be separated. And so that was another thing that, uh, another dangerous prayer. <laughs> I, I didn't, you know, when he said travel or what have you. So my confession from that time was, I'm in covenant with you. Use me in whatever way you want to use me. 
Send me wherever you want to send me. It's all about you. Here I am. Send me. <laughs> I didn't expect to get plastered in different parts of the planet, you know, on the other side of the earth and be separated from my family. And it, it was a challenge because we, my wife and I, when we met, we tore up the world and we still are. <laughs> we, we don't like to be separated. And, uh, but this was tough. And in those years, there's no cell phone. I'm on the other side of the world and I got to send a letter. Who oh, God knows how long that'll take, depending what country you mail it from. And then it got to be, well, of course, it was very expensive for long distance phone calls, very expensive. And, uh, you know, I made a collect call once from, um, at that time, where would it have been? Oh, in Romania. And uh, I, I, I wanted to collect. So I, you know, wrote it out on paper because they're not too good at English. And after the call, I went down and, uh, to check on it. And here, they charged my room for it. So the, that half hour call was $830. But I never had to pay for it because I was arrested a short time afterwards. <laughs> And the head of the KGB in that area was interrogating me and my buddy. They hauled us out of the hotel over to uh, this big building over there. And in the process, of course, uh, he said was, I had to leave the country. You know, got kicked out. I says, well, I can't leave. I got this telephone bill. No problem, all taken care of. <laughs> so anyway, get arrested. You won't have to pay the bill. All right, so... <laughs> So then, you know, we stayed, I stayed in homes a lot, but then it got to be, you know, if Kathleen wanted to talk to me in the middle of the night or what have you, you had to wake up, you know, it's just tough with waking up people and all that. So then I said, okay, you call me to be separated uh, like this, and so it should be no problem for you, Lord, for me to have hotels and be, no matter what the phone bill is every month, it's, you know, to keep us current, keep our relationship going. And, you know, he honored it from that point. I mean, he did. We went after it, so that's the way it's been. So that was another dangerous prayer. <laughs> Use me. Send me. <laughs> I didn't expect that, you know, because I was so used to pastors. They pastor all week, home with their family all the time, right? God. Yeah. Well, anyway, that's not in me. <laughs> it wouldn't, well, anyway, we'll get, we'll get on that. And it's just different callings. So those were two dangerous prayers. And uh, I had someone say, you know, I had uh, started to say a moment ago, uh, it just a situation came up where I needed to uh, help my wife because there are a lot of things she couldn't do at that point. And so we agreed a little over a year ago in January that I would cut back. And it was major cut back. I would do one trip a month. Six, I, I keep it, no, I like this six-day run is about it. And then my daughter just flew down from Tulsa to be with my wife the six days that I'm gone. But so you're one of the, I've managed to do Wisconsin and you <laughs> in six days. And three days on the road and three days meetings. But at any rate, uh, it's what we're doing. And so someone said, well, how can you do that? I mean, uh, what are you going to do for income with no meetings? Well, I was not used to thinking that way because meetings have never been my income. Now, it's okay. Some people believe for a certain, they go on a trip, certain amount of money. I couldn't do it. Again, because of my background, I suppose. But another thing, a benefit of that, that I realized later, of not going someplace for an honorarium, it's up to God. He speaks to people. You know, that's just where I'm at. Again, you don't have to do that. It's just, I mean, we're all different. So don't get into bondage. But I had to do it that way. And so I'm so used to, through these years, meetings are not my source. And there were times I'd go to even full gospel. I remember one time I went to full gospel, I didn't get a dime, and I traveled 600 miles one way by car. Well, I didn't get into strife with him. I mean, God's my, you know, he's the Lord. Another place they did a, a charism uh, charismatic meetings so they had in this Episcopal church. And they, they'd have speakers come in every Saturday night. Well, they brought me in, and, and, and usually I didn't realize it until I found out later. We'd get a full, I thought it was always a full, you know, sanctuary. But they'd come to hear about faith when I would come. And, of course, they would take an offering for me. But it was interesting that the offering was oh, exactly $125 every time. <laughs> but I didn't realize what was going on until I got a phone call from somebody that was at the meeting and wanted to know if I got the check that was designated for me. 
which was five hundred dollars. Oh, okay. So they had kept that. See, well, that's their problem, not mine. And so a week after that phone call, maybe two weeks, I got the mail again. You know, I pick up the mail because I'm doing everything. I put the adding machine in the trunk, and I got the mail in the trunk, and then hotels at night, I do all the receipting. And here was a check for $7,000. Now, back in the 70s, that's a lot of money. So they can keep the $500. <laughs> I'll take the $7,000. <laughs> but, you know... See, God, God will take care of you, you know. And so what it's done, it's, it was a prayer. It was a dangerous prayer. You know, you're my source, not me or anything else. But it, kept, it gave me the freedom to preach the truth. And I've preached the truth and never got invited back again, you know. <laughs> but see, that's okay. Because God's called me to preach the truth, not compromise and twist it just to keep people happy. And I was just uh, this morning thinking about it, and I just right off the top of my head, I could think of four millionaires that left the church, or left the ministry, rather, because I wouldn't agree with them. So they took their money with them, which is fine. God's my source, not you. Right. Yeah. Isn't it amazing how people get, you know, they get some place, they get some money, and they think now they're spiritual and can run the church. I'm telling you, it's one thing to be a member out there, it's another thing to be standing in the fivefold office there's things that go with it that just don't go with the ordinary. And I didn't realize that at the time either, but I'm learning it through the years. It's a little slow, but I'm getting there. And uh, so that was that, that dangerous prayer of, you are my source. But really, it's the best thing going because nothing has changed this past year. I've cut the meetings drastically down and nothing's changed. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> Hallelujah. Now, I... Uh, so anyway, <laughs> that's a little of that. So um, we, um, I uh, didn't realize, uh, you know, I didn't understand the fivefold, and of course we're going to be laying hands on one this morning. But, um, but I look back now, isn't that something? Hindsight's twenty twenty. So I left that church, Started traveling then the second year, and then I knew Soner started traveling full time the second year in 1976, and that's when the first uh, a Bible study wanted me to come 40 miles south of there and uh, help them turn into a church. So that was the first one in Redwood Falls, Minnesota. I told him, now look, the traveling ministry is the main ministry. I'll be with you as much as I can, but I can't guarantee you that, I, well, I know I won't be with you every Sunday. And boy, I'm telling you, they took really good care of me. I'm back there, and I mean, when you look back, in 1976, 77, I joined up with them. Uh, I mean, they, they furnished a parsonage. Uh, all the benefit, uh, charge anything you want at the hardware store, the gas station, whatever you need. And, and I mean, it was like $2,500 a month. I mean, it was a lot of money back there. They took really good care of me. So after, uh, that was in the fall, and then come springtime, they says, would you consider staying full-time as pastor? And we let you travel maybe once a month. And as soon as he said that, I could feel that. <laughs> <laughs> we might let you travel. Well, <sighs> well, I, I, pr I said, I'll pray. I wouldn't have had to because I told him when I got there that you know, I'll, with, I'll be with you until you're big enough to support a pa pastor, which they were right now. So I stayed several more months, we found a pastor, and I'm telling you, when I left that place, went back 40 miles north where he'd come from, you know, the 2,500 a month was gone, just like that. I am telling you, for the next several months, it was like, where are we gonna get money for a loaf of bread, and what have you? But then the slack took up, and all of a sudden it started, you know, got it coming in again. And I just, I said, I'm not getting, see, I was getting a salary with the church. And I said, that's not going to happen again. No way. I'm not going to, you know, get all into a place where you don't have to exercise my faith. It's always going to be there every week. And uh, so my, I, I operate best when God gives me my salaries. <laughs> and that's the way it's been. So I, I, I made a deal there. But anyway... 
So it has been exciting, uh, but these dangerous prayers, you just better be ready. <laughs> but it's not bad. I'm glad I made those prayers because it's just like with uh, Jesus. We grow like he did. Now, when we talk about the gifts that are in us, we talk about fivefold, because I just made reference to that just now, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. But let's understand one thing. Every single member of the body of Christ has gifts that are placed in them for whatever God had in mind for you. And you know, like my testimony is probably the best example. Here is a Baptist church in Minot, North Dakota, telling their congregants, don't assume that everybody in your neighborhood is born again. See, they believe that you have to be born again. And so he then would it distributed, you know, the Campus Crusade material to them that they could use to have a Bible study. So a couple in our neighborhood, I found out later, with fear and trembling, because he worked for the Game and Fish and she was a housewife, they're not fivefold, they didn't do any Bible teaching of any kind, and now they're asked to have a Bible study. So they obeyed the pastor. But there was a gift in it. You know, as I look back now, because they, they had enough, they knew some things about Jesus. It was just like when God called me in 76, I knew very little, and I said, well, there must be somebody that knows the little bit that I know, which was a little bit. And that's when he swung the doors wide open for all these homes for us to go into. Oh, man, we were just, they went home Bible studies everywhere. And eventually they all turned into churches, of course, but I didn't know that's what was going to happen. But uh, so they knocked on our door on that Friday and asked us to come to their home on the following Tuesday for the, and it turned out was their first Bible study. They obeyed God. And um, I don't know, uh, oh, how should I say this? I, I had a really, really, really crazy background. In 1964, I took uh, a long story, just give you the bottom line. I ended up killing myself. I literally took my car, brand new 64 Buick, February 9th, 11.05 a.m. Sunday morning. I come off that hill, three quarter mile run, floorboard, I mean, the needle is buried. And the last thing I remember, because I thought Grandpa was talking to me, I didn't, never read the Bible. I didn't, I wasn't born again. I never went, you know, read the Bible. I didn't know anything about familiar spirits, so I thought he was talking to me. And he was my favorite grandfather, and he hated my dad, I did too. But I just remember turning the wheel, Grandpa, here I come. I don't remember hitting the bridge, but, but the car went to pieces, and I was given up for dead. Called all the family together that night, and I was out of it until Thursday. Suicide. And now, and then there was another time, I was heading for it, but then here I am, they knocked on my door on Friday, the day before I had already, after four and a half years of sobriety, gone back to college, working on our marriage, paying our bills, everything looks so great. And, but now I'm, I'm thinking, I'd never fallen off, didn't drink anything since November 2nd, 67. But the thoughts were, this is crazy. I'm staying sober out of sheer willpower. What's the use? And so for the third time, I'm heading for this bridge. You know, the first time I hit it. Second time I was diverted, ended up in a treatment center. But here I am, Thursday. So I figured, well, the following Thursday, next week Thursday, I'm heading south. Now it's 200 miles to drive instead of 100 to get to that bridge. So they knock on the door. Tuesday, I'm at the Bible study as an arrogant big mouth. I'm going to go there and set those dumb church people straight about us AA people. We talk more about God than they do. And, uh, but you know, I couldn't say a word at that Bible study. And I look back now, it was because the presence of God was there. That's what I believe. And I listened. And all they did for their first Bible study was just, they worked that track, the four spiritual laws. That's all. They weren't Bible teachers, but they had a gift in them that God used. We listened. And all 14 of us neighbors that showed up received the Lord that night. Now, it was by faith. I didn't feel anything. I, get, I like to get excited. And so Wednesday was what I call it flat, still no feelings. But Thursday morning now, I'm heading, it's time to go to the bridge and end it all. And I come out of the back bedroom, I come into the kitchen, and my wife 
didn't, you know, she didn't say good morning. She said, Jim, you are not cussing anymore. That's how foul my mouth was. And I'm 29 years old. I'm an adult. I'm not a child. But I felt something move in here. Jesus got in here. I don't know how. But he's in there. <laughs> and, and, you know, and I declared that I'd never take his name in vain again. And we started reading the Bible, and it was like Jesus was talking to us, and it's still the same today. But see, there's gifts out there. It isn't all pulpit ministry. And we all have a gift. And what is it? Well, I'll tell you how it can be developed, and that's through the anointing. Jesus came into this world literally as a human being in every respect. Hebrews 2.14, Hebrews 2.17, Philippians 2.5-8. He had to, legally, in order to redeem us and destroy the devil, he, could, he had to do it exactly as a human being and leave all of his God privileges in heaven. <clears throat> and you all know that. Well, one reason for his success was he was raised with a good Jewish parents. And how many of you are familiar with Joshua 1, 8 in this church? Huh? Meditating on the word of the Lord day and night. Well, that's exactly what Jesus did. You know, the Old Testament talks about Jesus, not only him hanging on the cross there in Psalms chapter 22, but in Psalms 119, here we hear Jesus speaking, and he says this in 119, let me get down to, uh, where are you, 119? And uh, here in verse 97, Oh, how I love your law, your word. It's my meditation all the day. That's Jesus speaking. Now you can read on from 97, but when you get up here to 101, I've restrained my feet from every evil way that I may keep your word. I have not departed from your judgment, for you yourself have taught me. There's no man I know that, has, that was able to restrain his feet from every evil way except Jesus. And he said, you have taught me. Well, that comes, it takes us right back here again to the uh, Gospel of John and where Jesus said to, he says that, I, he talks again about the father teaching him. But then in Luke, and here's where the gifts, he had a gift in him, obviously. <laughs> he had a great gift. He operated all five, fivefold. But uh, where am I going? Oh, Luke. And he comes back here then in Luke. And, I, and this is really the way it happens with you and me as well. It says here in Luke chapter 2, and I come down here to verse 40, and the child grew and became strong filled with wisdom. See, if he had had God in him, he would have had the wisdom. But he came as a man. And he had to grow physically and he had to grow spiritually. And the end of the chapter, verse 52, and in chapter 2 of Luke, and, and uh, where is he? And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God. So these gifts in us will increase as we continue to meditate on the word and look to him. Now in my case, I started that, I was with that church of 12 people, and then I started another church then as soon as I left Redwood Falls after that little over a year with them. And no sooner had I started that other church up in Wilmer because the previous church that I was pastoring no longer existed after I left. But do you know that of that 82 or 84 people, 44 of them went to Ramah? Okay, that's incredible. Well, now we start another church from scratch, and no sooner did that when four more Bible studies wanted to go. So we were doing five churches every Sunday. And of course, there was this uh, young man that was in the original church of 12. He went to Ramah, and now he's come back with a wife. And so he come on board to help me. So I'd do three Sundays, and he'd do uh, two, then I, he'd do three, then I'd do two the next two Sundays. But the churches were like 50 miles that way, 100 miles that way, 60 miles that way, and 50 that way. So I mean, they're out there. So we were doing all this circuit preaching until they were big enough to support pastors. But I noticed in the church that I started in Wilmer, I look back now, and I, and I felt I left again in 81, you know, moved to Tulsa to see that, uh, because AFCM had come on board now and with all the pastors overseeing. But I stayed too long. I didn't realize that the gift in me was not pastoring. It was apostolic. It was to get it started and turn it over. And I held on it a little, I, held, I stayed there too long. And if I'd have left a year or two earlier, it would have been a whole better situation. So, you know, we, we learn as we go. And sometimes, a lot of times, it's just trial and error. So, 
Uh, you, you, you make a mistake, just get up. I always say, shake off the dust and go after it again. Or, you know, repent, receive forgiveness. We, none of us are perfect. We're still, I'm still learning. I'm still, <laughs> I know I haven't maxed this thing out by a long shot. And I just wish I knew everything, but I don't know everything. But I do my best to walk in the light that he gives me. Yeah, and I continue to meditate and study and pray. And it's amazing. It seems like every morning when I pray, it's like I see something else. Another nugget, I call it. Oh, I didn't see that before. And, you know, it just keeps growing. And that's the way it is for all of us in this room. Yes. Yes. That's good. Now, we in the fivefold, the Bible is very clear that we as teachers... We twist the scriptures or we do things that aren't right with the word. The penalty for us is much more severe. So there comes a responsibility with the fivefold. We're to be the examples. We're to live a life that people can look at and say that's the way it can be done. So there's more responsibility. And the penalty is more severe if we blow it. Amen. Amen, amen. I didn't choose to be in this office, <laughs> but I'm trusting him to help me. And that's the way it is for all of us in this room. So never let the devil say it's over with. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Repent. The scriptures say if we will really repent, he'll forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness and enable us to stand in his presence like we've never missed it, just like it was before Adam even sinned. And there we can enter the most holy place, the key in Hebrews 10, Hebrews 10, 19. We can enter the most holy place uh, and, and walk in his presence like we've never done anything wrong. Isn't that awesome? What an awesome God we serve. What an awesome God. And he'll do everything he can to help us, to stay close with him. And the devil's going to do everything he can to try to pull us away, right? But we know he's defeated and we're stronger than the devil is. You just have to let him know. Yes. You know, I uh, was in uh, Israel. Uh, oh, now it's about two years ago, I suppose. But one of our very first meetings that we had was um, with a general, uh, an Israeli general. And I, he was really powerful. But I remember there's one, there's a, one phrase that he said that I never forgot because I, it was biblical. He said, if you're going to defeat the enemy, first of all, you've got to know your enemy. Doesn't that sound smart? And so he required all of his men to read the Koran. It's Jews that are reading the Koran. Secondly, you've got to let the enemy know you're stronger than you, that you're stronger than they are. And everybody in this region knows we are. <laughs> and I said, well, that's right out of the Bible. Satan's our enemy. We need to know how he works. But secondly, we also need to let the devil know that he's already totally defeated and we are stronger than you, devil. So don't listen to the stupid. He's a liar. I hear, I hear some people say, well, the devil told me. What are you listening to a liar for? <laughs> Why don't you run around and say, Jesus told me. And Jesus will let you know he's totally defeated and we have been given the authority over Satan and all forces of darkness. All right, I've got to get back on track here. All right, so we want to, the, these gifts, we're going to, uh, here in a moment, going to lay hands on, uh, uh, well, I guess it would be Joy. Isn't that right? Not Julius, Joy. <laughs> Make sure we keep these names right. <laughs> Julius happens to be my name. How many of you know that? <laughs> Weird. I thought it was Jim, huh? <laughs> oh, my real name is Julius. <laughs> It has some royalty with it. No, I don't know. But anyway, <laughs> my dad's name was Julius. I was Julius. He didn't have a middle name. I did, so he was Julius, and my mother called me Jimmy. All right, so, but when we, <laughs> boy, you know, I'm getting off the track here, right and left. We're talking about gifts <laughs> and how dangerous <laughs> things are, these dangerous prayers that you have in this church. All right, but anyway... Oh, I know where I was going. Coming back here to Acts 13. I thought it was kind of interesting because here in the first three verses, of course, it starts off by naming all of these prophets and teachers. And, of course, in that bunch was Saul, which later would be called Paul. And, uh, but in verse 2, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, 
the Holy Spirit said, Now separate to me Barnabas and Saul, that's Paul, for the work to which I have called them. Now, we all have a, a calling. We all have a work that God wants us to perform. And then, there, of course, there's the fivefold. Now, here's the fivefold, but he says, Then having fasted and prayed and laid hands on them, they sent them away. You know, that's awesome. So there's a lot more to uh, laying hands than just laying hands on the sick, obviously. And then years later, <laughs> many years later, you know how you, I don't know how many times I've read this Bible, but isn't it amazing, no matter how many times you read a verse or the Bible, what have you, 20 years later you see things, you thought you saw everything in that verse 20 years ago, and now it's like the first time you saw it. And so here it is with the Apostle Paul in Romans now. Now he is the author here of the book of Romans, and here's what he had to say. And when I saw this, verse 11, I says, Ah, now I know what happened in Acts 13 when they laid its hands on him and separated them. Because here's what he says now. Now he's on the other end now, laying hands on people instead of hands being laid on him. And he says, For I long to see you that I may impart to you some spiritual gift so that you may be established. And the Bible says, may be strengthened and established. So when they laid hands on Paul, or Saul, back there in Acts 13, both he and Barnabas were strengthened, and they were established to do what they were called to do. Amen. And do you know that all the things that Paul went through, you've read that list, you know, shipwrecked, beaten, you know, stoned, left for dead, and all this sort of thing, he was obviously strengthened and established. And now it was his turn to strengthen and establish others. So I don't understand everything, and I don't have to, because I, you know, when it comes to the things of the spirit, you can't do it in the flesh or with human reasoning. And, but it's by faith, and that's the only way you can walk with God. And the things of the spirit you can't see, by faith though, I really believe. Now I've never seen my angels, but people have twice, once in the state of Montana and then other ones in Finland, but they were watching them move with me when I walked, and I can, so I'm conscious of that that they're, they're here, people have seen them. But I don't have to see them, I know they're there because the Bible says we've got angels. The guardian angels never left us just because we grew up. Yeah. That's right. That's right. They're still with us. I've never seen Jesus, but yet it says that where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst of them. But I know one morning, some years back in the state of New York, um, my wife's sitting, you know, like there, and I know something's going on with her, but I would only find out after the service, found out that Jesus appeared, and he was listening to me preach. Wow. See, she thought, she, a little uncomfortable when I pre share some things from the Word, she says, oh, people are going to get upset with you, or what have you, and I have to sit in the front row, and, uh, <laughs> and so she was having a little challenge, because of some of the messages I'd preached, like simple messages, like you, don't let your flesh take you to hell, you know, things like that, <laughs> and uh, the, she's sitting there, <laughs> I wish I was in the back row, people are staring at me, and Jesus appeared, and she says, he was standing there, listening, and she says you could tell that he was pleased with what he was hearing. And so he appeared to help her. But since then, guess what? I keep looking that way. <laughs> he's here. It's by faith. I really believe he is. He's here. He's in us. He's with us. Isn't that awesome? So this morning, you know, I don't really understand everything about the gifts. But I know that the anointing, which is the Holy Spirit... You know, he can stir up those gifts, he can strengthen, he can encourage us, he can cause wisdom to come, he can cause the gifts to develop in all of us, in all of us, as we release our faith each day. And uh, we, whether you're an auto mechanic or a school teacher or a lawyer or what have you, as you read the word every day and release your faith, he can, he can develop that gift in you, and guess what? It'll reach people wherever you're at. I mean, you can get people, as an auto mechanic, you've got people you can reach that preachers can't reach. Right. Or school teachers. What a ministry for school teachers. Tough, though, because wow. you can't talk about Jesus wow. in the States either now, wow. in the schools, you know. Yes. But there's ways. Yes. And, of course, people see Jesus in you, yes. and pretty soon they're asking questions and, you know, what have you. So we are the light out there. I guess you change it to the light, huh? Yes. 
hey, hey, how do you like that? I worked it in the message. That had to be the Holy Ghost. We're the light. Thanks so much for joining us today. We pray that your life was impacted by this service and you are able to feel the tangible love of Jesus fill whatever space you're listening from. Maybe you found this message and you've never had the opportunity to come into a personal relationship with Jesus, or you've known about him, but been far from him. We wanna give you the opportunity to make his love a daily reality in your life. Jesus came to this earth and died on the cross so that you could be close to him. He wanted to wipe away every disappointment and bring you into a life of purpose and meaning, one that will impact this globe for good. If you'd like to begin this journey with Jesus today, then just repeat this simple prayer after me. Dear Jesus, I'm praying this prayer because I know that I've made mistakes and been living without you. I apologize and I trust that you will forgive me. I accept your love and grace and ask that you would be my Savior and my Lord. Help me believe in you and love you every day. And help me to show the world what you're like and how great your love is. I commit to live for you from this moment forward. In Jesus' name, amen. All of our Light City family are joining with heaven and celebrating over the commitment you have just made to make Jesus the Lord of your life. We have resources available for you to help you on this journey. And most of all, we're praying for you. Send us a note at info at golightcity.com to let us know about the decision you've made today. We have resources we would love to send you with some easy steps on where to go from here so that you can discover God in a real and meaningful way. If you have a prayer request, our team would love to connect with you and partner with you to see God transform your life. God bless you, and we look forward to hearing from you real soon.